Hey watercolor wizards, Hajra here. Today we'll be working on some different ink and wash landscapes. And these are just a lot of fun to do as projects on their own when you don't wanna do something more intricate or you can do them as mapping out for more intricate pieces, whether it's color mapping or layout mapping. Art blogs, Q and A's, art notes, sketches, deconstructed painting posts, and art gift rewards are available for my patrons on Patreon. So thanks for parking your brushes here and let the epic painting adventures begin. I basically have these stencils that I've never used. I only have like a few stencils and they had little rectangular shapes. And I've also had some that had like square shapes. And I also had some that had these like little bracket shapes. And I didn't really know what to do with them. I think I've had them for several years and this is the first time I finally wanted to use them. My plan was always to maybe have some picture book that was done in vignettes only and then to use these as little vignette frame setups to do uh, illustrations inside of. So I thought it would be a good idea to use the stencils for the first time and then also just plan some cool, fun, quick art. I did start out doing the first two without any ink and wash outlines and then because the watercolor doesn't blend really well on here, there's very limited blending time, I was getting harder edges than I would like. So then I thought why not just embrace that and make it into an ink and wash piece so I have the harder lines of the ink anyway and then do a simpler watercolor wash. So I just came up with several and I think there's 13 total. So it's like a cute little collection of 13 little ink and wash watercolor miniatures. Let's get started on that. And I'll be using my Sonelli dot card colors for these because it's just nice to be able to test out those colors on something other than the dot card. So I've always said that if you're working on something that's ATC sized or postcard sized, you can always use those colors and it's a great way to get the colors on something other than the dot card and feel like your dot card investment went a long way. I of course was sent my dot card for free from the UK by Autokino, who Sonelli does not make a dot card of their own right now. But what I've done is I've wet the background of this guy first, trying to imagine some kind of fantastical scene for all of these. I've done my Beatrix Potter ornaments on this paper. You can only really do simple pieces on this paper because of the fact that it is soft size and it is a pleasure to work with and see the blends. It's a paper that's made by Arches. It's called BFK Reeves but it doesn't really do anything more complicated than ink and wash, so you really have to sort of be okay with that when you're using this paper. And I'm pretty sure once I'm done with this paper that I probably won't be getting it again. And I think I can just do ink and wash on my arches too, and then also if I want to do the more complicated stuff, I can. Lovely paper for simpler pieces. It dries really flat. I've done my ink maps on here. I've done ornaments. I've done other ink and wash pieces. And so I sort of wanted to show this castle high up in the clouds someplace and it was just a really quick sketch totally up to you you can use it to do little thumbnail concept sketches to lay out colors or to lay out your composition and sort of plan that for future things or you can just have a little bit of fun with it kind of like how the castle bleeds out into a halo there because i've seen castles just like this in various picture books and stuff growing up when they have like a big glass castle on the hill and it's probably where i'm subconsciously pulling it from. So a really, really short amount of time to draw up this skyline. And I think I'm gonna wet this so this doesn't turn into a hard edge. Take it all the way across. And yeah, this is like a 30 second drawing. And it does sort of set you free to work at this size rather than always doing something more complicated and always doing something larger. It is fun to maybe pull out either a really small piece of paper, work at an ATC size or a postcard size, and limit the amount of details. For me, that's one of the few things that's ever worked for me to force me to limit details, otherwise I just sit there. If I do something really large, I end up not being able to control how I'm putting details in it. And so I think if you have that problem at all, or if you just like to have a feeling of accomplishment at a smaller scale because you do finish smaller pieces faster, then pull out a small piece of paper or, you know, get a circle template or an oval template or a rectangular template and then come around and just think of something you see online and on Instagram. And if you see a, a tree line that you like, one of these counts that do animals or landscapes or whatever, and remember copyrighted pictures you can't really use uh, directly. But if you see like a wooded tree line, you know, I've seen wooded tree lines so many times on there and you want to do something like this with it, which is that it's just your own made up tree line, but it's inspired by the fact that you saw nothing but trees in a photo someplace, then that's perfectly okay. 
as long as you're not using that photo directly and you just sort of have it as an inspiration in your head as to what you saw, because that's just basically you operating off of what you see in the world. And I'm using this triangle wedge brush that I reviewed in a previous video. And like I said, it works as a combination for like a angle and a round. And that's what I'm using it for, is just to stand in for an angle and a round for these simple pieces. And I know people do nice loose one stroke type flowers with this, but since that's not really my style, then I'm gonna use this just for the kind of painting I'm doing. Heighten up some of the, the yellow here just at the center, because it's faded a bit. And also add some of that glowy yellow down the side of this hill. I'm gonna let this skyline dry before I come back in with the sky. Scratch your artistic itch without having some giant piece out. You can enjoy it just for this. You can make it super detailed here if you wanted to. You can make it simple here or you can draw it bigger someplace else. So I did this wet into wet again. I've done all of the things where I want soft blends wet into wet, which is I wet the paper first and then I come back and drop in some thin paint and it goes down really lovely. And again, I saw boats of various types on Instagram, on some of my various feeds and photographs. And then one of the boats that I saw had the bottom shape like this on a little lake, but it didn't have any sails. So I threw in the, the sails and I threw in the, the birds and making up the colors because I only like the bottom of that boat, but that's what I mean by all you need is a little bit of inspiration. You can't really use photographs like that. I and mean, if you want to use a photograph really closely, then it has to be copyright free. Otherwise you can only have like a loose inspiration for something really tiny like a bottom U shape of a boat made up piece for the rest of it. But I think that for something loose like this, you probably don't want to get too tied down to photo references. This is more about brainstorming and having fun, just doing some layouts without being overly attached to the idea of what is happening in a photo. I have a real satisfying feeling of being able to play with your paints and this is a good way to test colors too, so. Okay, and while I'm letting this bottom piece dry, I'm gonna go back up to the skyline here. It's mostly dry. Let's make sure I've got a little barrier of wet here in case that black hits the paper and doesn't want to go anywhere. Again, for soft sized paper, for a larger area, unless you want it to be a super hard edge when it hits the paper and stay that way, you really have to make sure you have a wet edge on the other side. Again, make sure your edges are properly blended out because you don't want them to go and sit in a hard line in the sky. And I'm just gonna keep adding some color up here. And now I'm gonna come back with the uh, blue that I have left here. I'm trying to emulate a night sky up here, so keep working at the colors you have too, and just sort of have a limited color scheme as well instead of, and I don't ever use black in a night sky, but it's kind of fun to do that. Kind of fun to do that in this case. I got a different blue now here. This is more of a turquoisey blue. And I can use a gel pen later to come back and put in some stars or I can spatter some white in. I prefer the random look of the spatter more when it comes to the realism of the galaxy and what it would look like. But I do prefer to use a gel pen for convenience's sake to add a little bit more black on this side to balance the darkness. And that's nice. It makes it gotten the black moved around enough that it almost makes it look like there's clouds or something in the sky just to make them stand out a bit against that sky especially now that the sky is so dark it would be nice for some contrast mountains back there are purpley green and a little bit of green in there but try not to mix the colors completely evenly to have a little bit of green showing up in them just for fun That'll make them prettier. This is a great way to do uh, landscape journaling when you're traveling too, because it makes it so that it's not super complicated. Ink and wash really has an amazing way of looking just pretty and polished. If you want to do looser or lighter painting or glazes, just use the ink to pull something together and it'll really make all the difference in the world. A polished finished piece because you can be as loose and blendy as you want with your 
watercolor and then you'll have the ink pulling all of your lines and outlines together. So ink and wash is one of my favorite mediums. Before I ever did more complicated watercolor, I did ink and wash for many years before that because it was just so much fun to do something in a comic book style when I was growing up. Yeah. I think a nice red flag, maybe even orange, because blue and orange are complements, would be a nice a little punch of color in this piece here. So, see if I can go even more towards orange for the sail. And then just do a little area and then blend out the edge with some water. So that's wet on dry blending. And I think it would be nice to have this ship really be more like an old fashioned ship that comes in all sorts of cool colors and has a painted side and everything. So I think I'm gonna put a little bit of green teeny bit of blue, you know? The wood's been painted numerous times and it's got different colors in it. And it just really looks pretty. And I think I'll even put a little bit of red and orange in there. And this brush has a really nice point on it, so I'll go back and darken that up and darken up certain parts of this little flag so it looks like the little ripple is coming forward. Tannish brown, ochre type color because it's what I typically think of as being a cool old boat color and we're gonna come back down and make some of the parts darker or lighter. I think the very bottom of the boat that's sitting right next to the water should have a little bit more blue reflected up on it or purple. And I know that that's really tiny, but that's just a reflected color idea that you can use for a larger piece too greenish purple mountains back there and they would also be reflected in the the water so I'll go ahead and throw that in as a little reflection and I'm doing this wet on dry so I can fold the lines a bit. Yeah I can definitely throw in a lot of stars like this. It's gonna take a lot longer than spattering though. <laughs> Makes it look like there's a arm of stars coming through here or something. And that's where it would show up in the sky too. If it was a real sky, you would see it showing up in the black area way more than it would show up in the blue area because there'd be too much light in those other areas for it to show up. And just do a lot of random dots. Don't think about it too much. That's why I really wish I could splatter because the splattering is the best way to make it look like it's not contrived. And I can do the same thing on the water here. This is where white becomes addictive. I want to look almost like the water. The boat came from over here, so it's like cutting a little bit of a trail, but like I said, it's not too <laughs> scientifically planned. Just a, a, a thought and a concept on here. Make some highlights on the boat here to make it look like some parts of the wood are more or less weathered. I can do that. And I think for this one, I should do a sunset purple and orange type sky. Purple first up here. And I'm gonna want a bridge color instead of going right into orange because orange has yellow in it and yellow is the complement to purple. So that's gonna make brown mud in the sky. So in order to prevent that from happening, I'm gonna wanna go to a cooler red someplace and use that as my bridge color. A nice magenta, which is also a great color for the sky. I really love these types of skies. I could do this type of sky for everything all the time, except for it'd make everything look a little bit too romantically golden hour lit. I don't think there's anything wrong with stuff being lit so it looks like it's the golden hour. A nice reddish orange. I think there's too much water puddling here, so I'm gonna scoop it up with my brush before I move on. Just do that orange down here. And it doesn't have to be very dark, it doesn't have to be opaque. It just has to be a hint of temperature change in this area. Anytime something settles into an unnatural edge in the sky, then you can go and play with it. Throw in even more color. Pretend like it's a, a real golden sunset going on at this time. It'll fade back a bit as it dries anyway. Okay, now that I've had way too much fun rainbowing up that sky, I'll let that dry. So I think I'll throw that in. And I'll probably mix some orange into it down here. A little bit of the color of the sky. Again, reflected color. 
showing up. It matches the sky just a bit more. And there's also certain kinds of desert foliage that have that as a color. So I'm gonna wait till the rest of the sky is completely dry before I come back and do the, the cactus and such, but I can go ahead and plan the corners out here. I ended up with a little lighthouse and a castle and two mason jars. I thought I'd put fireflies in the mason jars or a flower or something else. I really don't know. I might not even do those mason jars right now. So I'd say it would be nice if somebody had like a green painted lighthouse. And that might be too much of a neon green, even for my imagination right now. So I'll go and make it more of an olive green. And I think I want a little bit of red. I always assume that lighthouses have to have a little bit of red in them because I assume that, to me anyway, I feel like it would attract more attention. I assume that a little green and red lighthouse is neutral color that we have again, and then add some green to it or yellow to it to make it into a nighttime landscape. And again, I wouldn't really use very much of a neutral black. It's not really colors that I end up using unless I'm doing a, a grisaille for a very layered piece. For a piece like this, I just mix the shadow neutral of whatever colors I was using, so like the red and the green. But in this case, I'm using the dot card colors, so... So well, let's go with the sky here first. And I think I just want it to be pretty much an even sky, actually. No stars, no clouds. Something different than the other skies that we've done so far. Just a modest sky with not that much going on. But I guess we'll have an aqua sky now, at least for as long as this color lasts. I want to have something where the castle is what's the focal point in this piece, instead of it being the sky like it has been in some of the other pieces. Yeah, I'm not going to do the castle right now while the sky is wet, so let's do the mountains and the hills and such. It's a little bit too bright and strident to work for on its own, but that's why we've got other colors to dull it down with. I'm going to use red so that I'm using the complement to dye it down instead. And see how that automatically gives a nice brown. A different green dulled down with a, a red. I'm just going to keep adding a, you know, various colors to this until it stops looking so bright and raw. There is a really nice peacefulness to studying the colors or just studying the layout and not having to focus on details for every piece you do. And that's why little studies like this can be really valuable and not just fun, but valuable. And these ones further back are going to start out darker and then have some even darker colors in them so I can start straight out into the foresty color. And it took me almost no time, it took me like a few minutes to do this as an ink drawing. So don't spend more than a minute to three minutes or four minutes on any of these drawings. And it's still wet on the paper, so just putting it in at the tops of the trees will let the bottoms blend out and give me that nice little misty look to them. Wet into wet blending once you get the paper nice and wet. You can keep going for a while. You can always use your other brush to blend out edges. And just try to make up what I would feel like is a little hillside tree line here. A real benefit to varying the temperature. You've got the warmer greens and you've got the darker, cooler greens. You've got a little bit of red in there, some more brown. And just have a, a peak of that lighter green showing through. So I'm actually going to come back and darken up this pocket so it doesn't look like there's a focal point there or something that I didn't intend green before they turn into a shadow blue. And I'm going to go ahead and just put this down wet on dry and then blend out the bottom. And just blend out one side of it with a wet brush. Oops, that's going into my forest edge, which is one of the reasons why if you were a more patient person, you could wait till your forest had dried before coming back to ruin it because <laughs> now it just means I'm gonna have to go back into that area again to take care of it because it's got a bleed. Um, I mean, unless I like what happens with the bleed, in which case I'll just leave it, but I kind of like how it makes another pocket of something going on over there. So I'll just let that be a, a happy accident. With landscapes, you really do get that. I think one of the reasons good old Bob Ross used to say that is because for landscapes, everything can look like something happening someplace else. You know, maybe you don't know what it is, but your brain makes up an idea of what it might think is going on over there. Dry brush, wet on dry application, and see if that sticks a little bit better. Just wanted a hint of slightly different foliage up and around there instead of it always being the same color everywhere. 
one light base color down first for the whole castle and then come back and put in a few shadows, very simple, just for fun. I guess we sort of arbitrarily chosen that the light's coming from the left side so all the shadows are more towards the right side. While photorealism is fun and can be a nice skill to acquire and learn, sometimes you can say all that you want to say before you ever get to that point and it actually becomes more whimsical and more stylized and more sort of emotive before you get to photorealism because photorealism does tend to have less mood and have a more stilted look than something that is more stylized. I mean, not always, but it tends to be the case. So a little bit more shadow down the side here where again, it's like the base of the castle next to the bushes and all the trees and everything. And so the bleedy effects is that the colors, because you're applying them less dense, they tend to dry down quite a bit. Maybe I'll go back and feed a little bit of yellow into the highlights to make it a little bit more exciting. Could stand out on the hill a little bit better. Castle tops are still not sort of orange enough. A dark purple, which I prefer over the black night skies. Depending on the paper you use, the colors will fade back quite a bit. And it makes sense that this really absorbent, soft-sized paper is gonna have that as a situation where things are just drying back quite a bit. But now let me come back and make the whole sky a bit darker and dab rather than stroke so that it doesn't pick up pigment at the end of the stroke and that'll help make the whole sky pop a bit more. The white to streak out, just applying it even into the wet sky paint. If you want those little dendrite edges then apply it onto a, a wet paper. I think I'll make it a bit of a purpley blue just so that it matches. I lost the dendrites, but sort of settled differently with the sky in some of these places, and that's fine. Like too bright for a, a nighttime landscape out in the front of a lighthouse here. Cactus with a preliminary really light green, and again, and so I'll put some of it back there too. Yeah, so I might speed it up so it doesn't become the longest video in the world. Just a nice fun way to spend your afternoon doing some concept sketches. I waited till the sky dried and then I came back in and just did some greens and browns, a little bit of red mixed into the brown to reflect the sky color to finish up this cactus piece and then I'm done with this page. Try to go back and watch my other video where I talk about wet into wet and wet on dry blending edges and dry on dry blending edges. I do all of that in a recent video at real time so that you can check that out and have a better grasp of how to do those edges. Cause sometimes I do a lot of videos at a faster speed for efficiency and you don't get to see me do the blending at real time. So check out my live stream real time videos or that blended blending edges video that I did recently that has all of those things real time showing you how to blend all those edges and various degrees of wetness on the paper. You have a big range of realism in any kind of drawing and illustration. Like this is pretty simple in ink and wash, but there's still a higher degree of realism here than there would be if I made it very cartoony. Now you can see that also in other illustrations like Lion Decker or Muha, where obviously it was an illustration and not meant to be photorealism, but there is a lot of realism at play there. It's up to you how much realism you want to include. A lot of my pieces, despite falling into the category of more illustrative, tend to be pretty realistic in some of the rendering or the shadows or just the actual drafting, the line art, just as little teeny pieces that feel really amazing to finish. Or you can do them as thumbnails or concept art for color mapping or layout mapping for a larger and more intricate piece that you might work on later with one of these layouts. So it's totally up to you. And I really don't know if I'm gonna go come back and do outlines to these little vignettes or just leave them like this. I think I like the unfinished edge, but at the same time, I don't know if I'll, maybe the outline on them will look better. You know, who knows? Well, wizards, I hope you enjoy doing these lovely ink and wash landscapes and picture bookscapes with me. I just find them to be really magical and fun and not too intimidating, but something that feels really artistic and fulfilling and satisfying when you've finished it. Please like, subscribe, and check out my website links and Patreon page to support my art channel. Thanks for parking your brushes here and wishing you fantastical art adventures.